Um, so I do this, um, so welcome to the 17th annual John Hansrow Memorial Lecture <coughs> every year. Um, and it's in honor of uh, Dr. Hansborough, who um, was the first um, director of the Regional Brent Center <coughs> here at uh, I do an intro every year to talk about Dr. Hansborough because um, uh, not also not just because of his accomplishments, but also to remind everyone um, kind of what happened with him. His wife has asked me to kind of um, approach this subject every year just as a reminder that um, physician wellness is an important aspect of being a doctor. And I think we all forget that um, a lot of the time. So, so for those of you, and ignore the headline goes here, I don't know why that's still there. For those of you who don't know him, uh, Dr. Hansborough was born in Virginia in 1946. He uh, graduated from medical school from Harvard, did his surgical residency at the University of Colorado and was the, burn, um, the director of the burn unit there uh, after his residency. He was then recruited to come to UCSD in 1984 and stayed on as a uh, burn director until his untimely uh, death in 2001. He's had many academic accomplishments. Um, he is very well known for all of his research. Um, and this is in his short career is just a, a you know, um, part of what he would have been able to accomplish um, had he uh, continued to live. He, uh, his, his big thing that we still all talk about in the burn community is Translate. This was a skin substitute that he actually helped develop um, that one of the companies in town is actually looking to try and reproduce. So we'll see whether or not it makes a comeback. Uh, some of my older burn nurses are very excited about this. He does have a book out um, called Wound Coverage where he talks about um, skin substitutes and things that were at the time that he was practicing. This is actually a picture of what it looks like. And it, the, the cartridges are still like this. Um, we are trying to start a trial here looking at Translate. Um, but this is still one of the things that um, we all hope makes a comeback. He trained many fellows, um, had research grants, uh, did many national and international presentations, created many educational CD training videos, especially for the military. He had a close relationship with the Navy and frequently went across town to do uh, talks in terms of uh, talks about burn care and uh, pre-hospital um, uh, trauma care. His research projects were numerous. He was one of the first to really talk about uh, immediate feeding of burn patients, which we all know is very important. Um, he was one of the first at UCSD to talk, uh, to look at the, um, the effects of pentoxifiline in uh, the burn shock model. Uh, he was very involved um, in wound healing and again, um, was really uh, instrumental in looking at skin substitutes. But he wasn't always um, the man that you see here. Um, he had, um, some mental health issues, which um, were known, but um, he was probably suffering from without people really um, knowing at the time. This is a short video, you're gonna have to, um, if you would please watch um, that his, uh, and this is only a short clip of the, uh, I think it's an hour long video looking at suicide. Dr. Hens illustrates the complex interplay of personal and cultural factors at work in this issue. It also shows that the impact from even one physician's death can be profound. It's a huge loss. I just, you know, thank God every day that I was in the area that I was, you know, to be at, at that hospital and with Dr. Hansborough, because I know I would have not got the same care in that treatment that I got there. John was brilliant. He contributed a lot to the literature and to to knowledge as well as to his patients and and it was his passion and so when he died they lost a physician with a passion for taking care of those patients i've thought a lot about the culture of medical care and nursing care in the last few years and i think that it's important for physicians to begin to recognize um, emotional needs of their patients first. And, and, and maybe in doing that, they'll become more comfortable with recognizing the emotional needs of each other. The institutional culture of medicine has to date accorded relatively low priority to physician mental health. 
So that's just a short Doctor. clip of, um, of that presentation. Um, but again, it, it talks, you know, it kind of broaches the subject of um, suicide and depression in physicians. This was a, an article that came out um, more than 15 years ago in the American Journal of Psychiatry that looked at the suicide rate in male physicians. Um, and overall, male physicians have a higher um, suicide rate than the general male population, and the same as in uh, women. And it, actually, in female physicians, the suicide rate is actually even higher compared to men. So, um, and the prevalence of depression among residents is higher than in uh, people who are similarly aged. So, this is a very real problem um, within our population um, and our, our field. Uh, in 2003, um, there was a consensus statement printed by the Journal of the American um, Medical Association that looked at depression and suicide in physicians. And they recommended even then tr trying to transform professional attitudes uh, and changing institutional policies to encourage physicians to seek help and trying to remove barriers um, as physicians learn how to confront their own depression um, and suicide, suicidality, not just in themselves, but also in their peers. Um, and to educate them so that they are more able to recognize these things in people around them, including their peers and their uh, trainees. So this goes back then to what can you do? Um, one is to establish your own personal health care. We are terrible at being patients in general, um, but it is better to find a physician that you can trust earlier on uh, that you can do your primary care with. Just find a primary care physician uh, that you uh, can get along with and maybe talk to. Learn to recognize um, the symptoms of suicidality and not just that, but also of depression. Um, and we don't even have to talk about super, severe depression. Um, not every person with depression has severe depression. Some people have a very mild case that can be helped and treated um, with therapy and sometimes with medications. And utilize the physician resources. Now, we don't always know what they are. So I did compile a list. Um, there is a HEAR program, the Healer, Healer Education Assessment and Referral Program. This program has several resources that are listed on their website. The, the website's at the top of the page um, for all sorts of different needs that you might have uh, in terms of your psychological health. Um, some of these are anonymous, some of these are not anonymous, but you can pick and choose um, which ones you feel are uh, needed. Um, it's a very extensive list. Um, what they might have you start with is a survey to kind of look at um, where you may be on the spectrum if you feel that you might be depressed. Um, this is actually anonymous, but at the end, they will ask you um, if you want to be contacted uh, based on what your results are. Um, there is, this is the whole list of resources that are listed on that website. And again, these, the ones on this first slide here are ones that are available through UCSD directly. Um, the Wellness Center, there is a Physician Wellbeing Committee um, I think this is the committee that Dr. Baruman is on, but if she's not on this committee, she is our well-being person. So if anybody out there has issues or concerns, she is a very approachable physician. Um, you can really go to Dr. Baruman and talk to her about anything, and I encourage you to do that. Um, outside of UCSD, these are the other resources that are available to you. Some of them are within San Diego. Some of them are national, um, national organizations. So please, I, I would encourage you to look at these um, if you have concerns. If you have a concern about your peer, um, it, I would encourage you, especially the, the, the residents, to go to an attending that you trust, um, one that, will, um, that you think will give you some good advice. And you know, worst case scenario, you go to your chief resident, if it's one of the junior residents, go to your chief resident that you trust and they can help you, um, guide you to you know, maybe someone to talk to or an organization that you can approach. Um, so if, there's, um, if there are any questions, please let me know, but this is just kind of a, a brief introduction to, to trying to make sure people take care of themselves. And I would highly encourage you to do that. Um, without any further ado then, and it's hard to know how people are doing because I can't see anybody. Um, I will go on with my introduction to uh, introduce our 17th uh, annual speaker. This is Dr. Lucy Wibbenmeyer. She is the interim director at the uh, Burns Center at the University of um, Iowa. She received her MD from the University of Tennessee at Memphis. Uh, from there, she went on to do her general surgery training at St. Louis University and did additional training in surgical critical care at um, the uh, Washington University in St. Louis. She has um, over 50 publications, including Burke chapters, um, and has mentored many students and fellows um, in research and in uh, clinical care. 
She is involved in both multi-institutional trials as well as industry research. Um, some of the multi-institutional trials are with the DOD and with the American Burn Association. Um, she is very deeply involved in the American Burn Association, has served on many um, committees, and is currently the president-elect uh, for the ABA, and hopefully that transition will happen at next year's meeting. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Lucy Webmeyer. Thank you, Jeannie, and thank you everyone for inviting me today to speak. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, so bear with me. Can you guys see that? We still see you. At least I do. Not good. Um, hmm. Let me escape. Escape. Okay, so I see you, screen two. Let me see if I put it over here. This worked so perfectly yesterday. So it seems like if I would put, let me do this. Let me move this over here. That is not still working, is it? No, uh, that's this. Let me move this over here. You, um, what do you see now? Is that my, that's not my screen, is it? Did you hit share screen on, I'm assuming you hit share screen on the Zoom. I did. Oh, here we go. I had to, I did. So no, I, I guess I had to hit it twice. Okay, let me do this. Working now, yep. Yes. See your screen. Now, do you see a talk? I think you need to move it to whichever, to a different, do you have two screens? Yes. Let me try moving it to the other one. There we go. Now I see a window. But you still don't see the talk, do you? It's, it looks like it's still opening. Now do you see it? Yes, we do. Do you just see one slide? We see your title slide. Okay, wonderful. Oh my goodness, I always think this is a little bit of a small miracle when this happens. Um, even with practicing, it just seems like things always go awry. But thank you, thank you for inviting me today. Um, thank you for allowing me to celebrate the life of Dr. John um, Hansborough. I didn't know him personally. He sounded like a, a wonderful man and mentor. Um, I have to say I was a little bit surprised when I was asked to speak about frostbite. Um, being from Iowa, we uh, really don't want to think about cold weather in June. And um, you guys are in California. Um, but Jeannie um, uh, assured me that you guys occasionally see frostbite and a review would be good to have. So here I am. And with not much ado, we'll start. Um, I have really no conflicts of interest to disclose, except that I love snow and I love everything there is to do with snow. So the winter of 2018, the polar vortex winter was difficult for us in the Midwest, in the Northern Midwest. We hit temperatures well below uh, zero, many, many days that winter, minus 15, minus 20 was not unusual. And we had so much frostbite. The last winter was somewhat more mild, um, but we still, every winter, when winter comes, uh, we get out and dust off our frostbite protocols and go to work. So um, the objectives of today's talk, we'll talk about history because we always talk about history. Um, then we'll jump to pathophysiology, what we know about frostbite. We'll then talk about diagnosis and classification. Um, we'll talk a little bit about initial treatment, what you have to do immediately. Then we'll discuss management after initial treatment, um, surgical management and non-surgical management. Um, we'll briefly touch on outcomes and um, then I'll present a patient. Uh, 
frostbite is uh, easy and hard to talk about, I'll have to share with you. Um, it's somewhat easy because the data isn't voluminous, but it's somewhat hard because the data, as we'll talk about, is, um, is um, hard to draw any conclusions from secondary to um, some lower quality studies and small studies and other problems. Um, so I'm gonna show this as my transition slide just to kind of get us in the mood. Uh, first, we'll talk about history. So uh, frostbite. So we do occasionally get the winter enthusiast, maybe the stranded motorist, but largely frostbite is a disease of the marginalized. Um, it's predominantly homeless people who get affected and admitted with frostbite, people who have mental illness and people who suffer from substance abuse. We did a retrospective review of 102 patients over a eight year period in Iowa. And um, those patients, um, the frostbite was, uh, alcohol was implicated in their frostbite in about almost 50%. Um, in about another almost 20% drugs were implicated and about 20% of that population was homeless. So it is a significant problem in people who uh, rely on their hands and their feet for daily survival. So not only is frostbite a problem for the marginalized, but it's also a problem for the military. The military has a long history of injuries sustained by cold and frostbite. Throughout the centuries, there's been huge losses. Hannibal lost half of his men um, while crossing the Alps. George Washington lost about 10% of his troops during the Revolutionary War. And during the two Russian invasions, the one by Napoleon in 1812 and the one by the Germans in World War II, um, both of those invasions lost huge casualties due to frostbite and cold injuries. The Germans alone lost about a quarter of a million of their troops. Um, more recently in the Korean War, um, African-Americans were four times more likely to suffer from frostbite than their white counterparts. Um, and then during the years of 2018 to 29, our military saw the highest rate of injury secondary to cold and frostbite. So it still remains a significant priority, priority for the military. So now we'll talk uh, a little bit about pathophysiology of frostbite. So frostbite um, involves three overlapping um, stages. The first one is hypoxia. When the body gets cold, it vasoconstricts. And then the hunting reflex occurs and you have a period of, um, of um, constriction followed by vasodilatation followed by constriction and then permanent constriction. What results from this is you get acidosis of your tissues, hypoxia, sludging, increased viscosity, and then ultimately thrombosis of the vessels. At the same time, you have ice crystal formation, both extracellularly and intracellularly. This destroys the, um, the cellular membrane and also leads to cell death. Both of these phases uh, lead to inflammation, which is maximal at the time of reperfusion when blood flow is restored. At this time, you have um, an inpouring of uh, cytokines, and uh, which, which lead to uh, platelet aggregation, more thrombosis, em emboli, and then ultimately vasoconstriction. So really when you're looking at frostbite, you're looking at an injury that causes both thrombosis and inflammation and you have to correct both of those states to preserve your digits in your limbs. So um, next, diagnosis and classification. So um, the, the best way to look at frostbite is really to look at it uh, like we look at burns. Um, although there's several classification schemes, I think this is probably the best way. So the left panel shows you normal skin. The panel number two is frost nip, which is very similar to superficial burn or um, first degree burn. So healing is really the rule here. Um, the skin may uh, take on a little erythematous um, tone to it, or it may just be pale. Um, it could be numb, but again, full recovery here um, after warming. Um, superficial frostbite is like second degree burn. Um, here you might have pale skin, or slightly reddish skin, and then pathognomonic for this, you'll have clear blisters. 
deep frostbite is like third degree burn. Here you're gonna have either a bluish or gray discoloration of the skin or a very deep red to the skin. And you will also have hemorrhagic blisters. For both superficial and deep frostbite, healing is not, uh, is not guaranteed uh, without mitigating the inflammatory and the thrombotic process. So this is a good example of what happens when you uh, treat frostbite by what we would call historical management. So the patient would present with hemorrhagic blisters, which would um, harden and mummify and um, gradually cause shrinkage of the digits. Um, this of course sets the patient up for um, uh, dry gangrene, which can eventually turn into wet gangrene in an emergency. Um, this, uh, the old adage came from this kind of treatment, um, frostbite in January, amputate in July. Um, occasionally, for various reasons, this is still practiced. However, with trust and, and more um, advanced modalities, we were able to offer surgery earlier and actually preserve more tissue length. As you can imagine, this was just quite a morbid um, thing for these patients to go through, especially when you're looking at the high homeless rate of um, patients. So frostbite is not only expensive to patients in terms of morbidity, but it's also expensive to hospitals who see a lot of this throughout the winter. This was a study that looked at the National Burn Repository. It compared frostbitten patients to similarly sized burn patients with um, burns to their feet and hands. And what they found was that frostbite patients stayed longer. They spent more time in the ICU. They more often lacked commercial insurance and they were more frequently discharged to facilities. So increasing their length of stay and increasing their cost. So um, now I'm gonna to transition to initial treatment. Um, I will not talk about uh, treating cold injury per se during this talk. Uh, the only thing I wanna mention is uh, when you get a patient with a cold core temperature, so less than 35, that patient needs to be warm first and then the frostbite addressed. And there's several good reviews about that. So uh, all the existing frostbite protocols draw from the Macaulay Protocol that was published by the University of Chicago in 1983. Some things have changed, but largely this protocol remains intact. The first and very most important thing you need to do for a frostbitten patient is to rewarm re the frostbitten areas in water at 40 to 42 degrees Celsius. This is usually done for about 15 to 30 minutes or until you get sensation, which is often burning and extremely painful back to the um, frostbitten extremity um, and flushing. Uh, next, most of us debride clear blisters uh, and then apply aloe vera. Aloe vera works here uh, along the cytokine cascade blocking thromboxane, which we all know thromboxane increases platelet aggregation. Um, it doesn't penetrate very well, so putting it over hemorrhagic blisters, which we usually leave intact to protect that deeper tissue injury, um, uh, the penetration might not be as great. We all elevate the extremities, avoid pressure, at least early on this is done. Uh, there was a study that was published that shows after 72 hours, uh, you can get patients up with frostbitten feet. Um, they all need pain medicine. These are tetanus prone injuries. Um, we either give aspirin or ibuprofen. And again, that blocks the cytokine cascade right at the cyclooxygenase. Um, we no longer give penicillin, just like we don't give um, empiric antibiotics for burn patients. And then they all go through hydrotherapy to keep the wounds clean and to keep the colonization low. So, um, like I said, many of these elements are still in place since 1983. Um, however, if patients present early, there are now more options, thankfully, to help their frostbitten extremities. So a decade after the Macaulay, um, Macaulay Protocol was published, a letter appeared uh, in JAMA to the editor. Um, this letter reported on a pilot study of four patients who were treated with IV, with severe frostbite who were treated with IV TPA, or I'm sorry, intraarterial TPA. In three of those patients, they were able to uh, not undergo any amputations. One had amputations, but he also had some concomitant soft tissue injury. So in this letter, it was just unclear. This was mind blowing at this time, uh, as you know, 
this was an option now to uh, move the needle forward. No, no longer had we, were we just relegated to watching and waiting, but now perhaps we had um, something that could bust, bust those clots and save that extremity. Um, interesting enough in the letter, um, the PI was quoted as saying, this is way too early and I feel bad that we're actually presenting this data. So the world would have to wait another decade for the, the paper to be published. Simultaneously, in Europe, studies were undergoing using iloprost, which is a prostacycline analog. Prostacycline is a vasodilator. It's also an anti-inflammatory agent. This letter to Lancet reported on five patients that they had used iloprost in, and all five patients had severe frostbite and did not have to undergo any amputations of their digits. So iloprost is not available in the US, so we're gonna go back and talk about TPA a little bit now. Um, how does TPA work? Well, TPA binds to um, plasminogen bound fibrin, splitting it into plasmin. Plasmin degrades the clot, creating the fibrin degradation products and uh, restores blood flow to the frostbitten extremity. So now, um, issue, now we issue in a new paradigm for frostbite treatment. With the publication finally of the paper out of Hennepin, that reported initially on the four patients. This was by Dr. Tomey and colleagues. This was a cohort study with historic controls. It spanned about 15 years. Um, they enrolled 35 patients and looked at 174 digits at risk. 19 of those patients got TPA. And um, their protocol, and again, many of the um, current day protocols um, are quite similar to this protocol. They, for the patients that got TPA, they included those that had no improvement after rewarming. They had absent Doppler signals on exam and they had um, no perfusion on, or perfusion deficits on scintigraphy. Um, at Hennepin, they could, they could get emergency bone scans. That's not so true today uh, at Hennepin, and it's certainly not true anywhere else I know in the world do our nuclear medicine physicians come in in the middle of the night for bone scans. Um, importantly, they used a cutoff of 48 hours of cold exposure to, um, for their TPA group. Um, they, their exclusion criteria are rather standard. Um, I will point out though for frostbite, repeated frost, freeze thaw cycles are uh, an exclusion criteria for TPA because those patients, uh, as you can imagine, they have repeated cycles of hypoxia and inflammation and then repeat hypoxia inflammation and they just do not do well. So what they found, um, they found in the patients who uh, received TPA, they had a very low amputation rate compared to 12 of the 16 patient, historic control patients that um, had digits amputated. Um, so their main conclusions were a delay of greater than 48 hours of cold exposure portended a bad um, outcome in terms of amputation um, and that either IV or IA um, had good results with um, digit salvage and, um, and it didn't matter where the frostbite was or the route of the TPA. So I'll just show you a couple of pictures from that article. Um, so here's a patient with severe frostbite. Um, this would be deep frostbite. You know, it's just erythematous, um, hemorrhagic blisters. Some of these are broken. Um, it's edematous. Um, here's a bone scan, a fuzzy, fuzzy bone scan. I'll show you some better pictures later um, where you see lack of perfusion to these lateral digits. And then you see this picture weeks later, weeks to a month later, where you see the mummified digits that have demarcated nicely showing you where the, where the amputation should be um, and they're shrunken. However, this is most likely months later. And then here's an example of a patient who got intravenous TPA. Again, he presents with third degree frostbite. The bone scan pre-TPA shows no perfusion to the extremities or to the fingers rather. And here is a post-TPA bone scan showing perfusion uh, restored to the fingertips. And here's a, a picture of showing complete digit salvage. So compare this to this. So where are we in terms of our studies, the literature, the results since that first pilot study that was published in 1992? Well, we're a little further ahead. Um, 
To date, we've only had one randomized controlled trial. This was a only level to be um, evidence because it's a, in the format of a, another letter to the editor, New England Journal, but only a letter. Um, and this is a little bit double dipping because I'll talk about this randomized controlled trial when I talk about Illiprost because they enrolled Illiprost and TPA in the study. Um, we've had eight retrospective cohort studies, four case series, and three case reports. In all total, 209 patients since the 90s have been enrolled in studies, uh, and we've looked at uh, 1,109 digits at risk. And I should say digits at risk. What do I mean by that? I mean that um, the best way to show a digit at risk is to have a pre-TPA runoff, and then you can see exactly where your perfusion stops, and then you can judge, well, that digit's at risk because there's no perfusion. Um, the next best way is a bone scan, um, which is plus minus in terms of its anatomy, the, uh, the anatomy that it can reveal, but that's the next best way. Then the, the third best way is your clinical exam. So um, that's what I mean by digits at risk. If there's no perfusion, they're a digit at risk. Um, if you save that digit, then that's considered digit salvage. So looking at this literature, what can we conclude? Well, there have been two reviews, one meta-analysis and one guideline paper developed on um, looking at the use of TPA and frostbite digit salvage. And the conclusions are not strong, secondary to low quality studies, small studies, and um, differing methodology and outcomes in all these studies. However, the one meta-analysis results are shown here. And, um, and what you see here is that IV, uh, either IV or intraarterial TPA has about a similar digit salvage rate. I should say limb or digit salvage rate, uh, which is pretty good, upper 70s when you're looking at the possibility of amputations. Um, and just as importantly, it had a very low complication rate. So TPA seems to have a role um, and it seems to not cause significant harm. So what's the guideline paper say? Well, the evidence not strong enough to give a standard and the guidelines are kind of weak and watered, watered down as well. Um, so what the guideline paper says is with high grade, that TPA should be considered with high grade frostbite that extends past the IP on the finger or the interphalangeal joint on the thumb or great toe. And in reality, what do we do? What do most centers do? I think we do what most centers do. Anyone who presents to us with second degree or higher frostbite or superficial frostbite, I guess, by the classification I gave you, um, that involves two or more fingers or toes, that involves a thumb or the big toe, uh, that has perfusion deficits on exam or by Doppler. Um, and then most importantly, um, we usually cut it off at 24 hours uh, the guidelines actually said 48 hours. So again, the, the data is not great. If we if if we if we we'll, we also weigh the pros and the cons and the amount of frostbite, and um, if it's a little bit over 24 hours from the uh, rewarming time, they may get enrolled um, in TPA, um, and they must have absence of freeze thaw cycles. That's pretty standard. So here's another great example: um, a frostbitten foot with uh, minimal flow to the great toe. Uh, pre-TPA, post-TPA. And at Iowa, we, we usually do intra-arterial, although we're looking uh, to now institute intravenous as well. So here's a post-TPA um, runoff and you see complete perfusion to the toes. In my mind, a great salvage. And here's another picture that kind of um, runs this home. Um, this is from Regions, a paper out of Regions. This is um, full thickness, um, I'm sorry, this is deep frostbite. You see these hemorrhagic blisters and um, just uh, black discolored skin, just horrific frostbite. Here's a pre-TPA runoff. Here's a post-TPA runoff. TPA, if you're doing an intraarterial, it's usually 24 hours. If you're doing an intravenous, it's usually um, for, uh... oh, we're just working on this protocol. I think it's for, I don't want to tell you wrong, but it's either from six to 24 hours, but this is post TPA. And then you have complete salvage of the digits here. So what happens? 
to, unfortunately, the majority of our patients who are out of the window. Are they really out of luck? Well, uh, in the U if you live in the US, yes, I'll have to say yes. Um, although in-hospital care is better than staying out of hospital, but you are out of luck in terms of being able to get reproduced with TPA. Now, Illipros, for those who live in Europe, offers a greater advantage. It is also given IV, and it can also be given and show uh, improvement after 72 hours from rewarming. Again, it's a vasodilatory agent, and it decreases inflammation. Um, with Illiprost, um, the caveat is that um, the infusions are long, and they can be uh, up to six days and sometimes longer. So what's the literature on Illiprost? So at the same time the literature was developing on TPA in the US, uh, Europe was developing literature on prostacycline um, or Illiprost. Um, here is the double dip study. So this is a study that uh, by Couchy et al. that actually was a letter to the editor in the New England Journal. Um, they enrolled 47 patients into three different groups. One group, uh, all, all patients actually received but a bufamidal, sorry, that's a pentoxifiline like agent. Um, the second group, uh, uh, the second group received illiprost, and the third group received illiprost and recombinant TPA. And uh, what they showed was that um, if you were able to infuse patients less than 12 hours from rewarming, you had pretty good results. So in the latter two groups, they showed a digit salvage rate of 80% compared to the historic control group. Um, and then if you uh, infuse them greater than 12 hours um, from their rewarming time, um, their salvage rate was still better than control, but it was about, it dropped to about 60%. So most people looking at the studies that I'll have to say are quite slim, um, say that uh, illiprost is similar in salvage rate, if not better than TPA. But let me just show you the literature. So Couchy enrolled the most. They enrolled a total of 32 patients in their illiprost or illiprost plus TPA arm. Um, and then I talked about their salvage rate. The other studies are, are quite small. Linford enrolled uh, four patients out of 20 um, in their illiprost arm, and they had a salvage rate of about 78%. And then these two other studies, um, Poole enrolled two patients with 100% salvage. And then of course that old study in 1994 enrolled five patients with 100% salvage. So um, small numbers here, unfortunately. So re to review, um, to recap, so Illipros can be given if you live in Europe, um, it, but it can be given up to 72 hours after cold exposure. Um, it's given by an infusion. Um, the infusion is usually given six plus days. Side effects are quite minimal. So now I'm gonna um, turn to operative management. So what helps us make our decisions? What helps us make, what helps us, uh, you know, um, pull the trigger and amputate? Um, well, the clinical exam is really not that reliable. So it can't, that can't be used as our sole indicator. Um, when we treat frostbite historically, frostbite in January, amputate in July, yeah, clinical exam um, is usually pretty accurate. However, you don't wanna wait that long. People don't wanna wait that long. So what really helps us make that decision is um, a bone scan, certainly, um, but better yet is a, a new modality, or at least a new modality in frostbite, uh, spec CT. So um, a bone scan can, has three phases has three phases, one tissue phase, vascular phase, and the, the, the latter phase, the bone phase, that is really what we use to judge where we should um, amputate. These are highly sensitive and specific for telling you where to amputate. And they are much better if you get them just a little bit further away from admission. The problem is these are very fuzzy images. I mean, here's, here's an example. Um, this is made a little bit easier because you have markers put here to show you where the fingertips are. So again, um, third degree frostbite or deep frostbite and um, absence of perfusion to the extremities. However, 
it's a, just a little hard to, to, to tell where that perfusion exactly ends. So better yet is spec CT in terms of really delineating the anatomy. So uh, again, this is severe frostbite to the forefoot, the heel, the sole. Here's a bone scan, the fuzzy bone scan that shows lack of perfusion. And here is a spec CT, which is actually a fusion uh, of the bone scintigraphy with a computer tomography. And here you can really see the detail. Uh, this is from a study by Kraft uh, et al. who looked at seven patients with frostbite and um, did spec CTs. And in six of those patients, they were able to amputate the extremity at a more distal location based on the findings of spec CT. So um, here's a patient from their study. And here's where his perfusion is estimated to end. And then here's his results after he went to the operating room. So they were able to salvage the soft tissue and salvage more length um, up to the uh, TMA in both of those areas where it looked like perhaps he was gonna lose all that soft tissue. And then of course he just needed some soft tissue coverage. So he was able to keep um, his feet for ambulation. So what about other agents? We hear a lot about different things with frostbite. The problem is the literature is just not supported uh, for any of these modalities. Um, the highest rated uh, treatment option is rapid rewarming. That's been a, around, by the way, since 1930s. Um, it came um, out of a Russian lab and then it was used during World War II by the Russians and the Germans when they suffered all those casualties. Um, that's gotten the highest grade. Otherwise, anti-inflammatories, are only weakly supported, um, as is aloe vera. Anticoagulation, I'll have to say, when it's used as a sole agent, has no um, evidence to support it. And then all these other modalities, hyperbaric, pentoxifiline, sympathetics, vasodilators, um, they have, again, no evidence, no strong evidence to support them. So a lot of research is where we need some work. Now, what about long-term outcomes? So you're able to save that digit. Um, does that make the patient better? Or the leg, does that make the patient better? Well, we really don't know, unfortunately. Um, this is the largest study that's been published. Um, it involved 30 patients who were followed from four to 11 years from their frostbite. Um, and over 50% of those patients had hypersensitivity to cold, as you might expect. About 40% still had numbness in their exposed digits. And about a third had suffered from decreased sensa uh, sensitivity to touch. Um, other uh, reported symptoms in the literature include um, chronic pain, chronic ulceration, and osteoporosis. So um, any studies in the future really need to focus on long-term outcomes and um, maybe uh, factors that um, would, want, uh, would lead us more towards amputation or more towards um, other treatment modalities to help with these issues. Now, finally, I'm gonna uh, present a case uh, that we had recently. Um, this was a 66-year-old female who uh, let her dogs out at night, slipped and fell, and her right boot came off. She was on the ground for about two plus hours until she was uh, found by a neighbor who brought her to our hospital. Here you see her right foot, and it, you see that it probably, um, the blisters are unroofed. It's, I'm, I'm thinking they were probably clear blisters. Um, you see air, an erythematous tone to her skin. And um, on exam, she was cold. Um, she had no perfusion to her foot and she had decreased sensation and movement of her toes. Um, this was a CTA. We don't always get CTAs, but um, I guess the interventionalist on call wanted a CTA um, first. And so uh, this was a CTA showing no runoff at the ankle, uh, from the ankle down. And I apologize for this image, but this is a runoff 24 hours after lysis. And what you see here, it's, it, I should say TPA is done for about 24 hours. Um, and what you see here is you see restoration of perfusion to her foot. Um, and then here's some pictures of her about a week later. I'm, I apologize, I don't have, um, more distant uh, photos, but she went on to complete salvage. Even this one uh, necrotic appearing area healed without skin graft. Um, she did at this time have some pain, but it was getting better. So um, a, 
a rather good uh, save in someone who could otherwise have had a BKA. So in summary, I wanted to update the Macaulay protocol for you. So um, it's true, we still rapidly rewarm. Um, they're all tetanus prone, so we check their immuni immunization status. Um, we still rest and elevate. We still do hydrotherapy. We debris clear blisters. It's painful, so they get pain medication. And we apply topical aloe vera to their wounds. Um, in addition, we give therapeutic anticoagulation for up to a month. If patients present less than 24 hours from rewarming, they are candidates for TPA. Currently we do IA and we're looking into intravenous. I should say that um, in order to increase the number of patients that can get to a facility within 24 hours of rewarming, some centers have looked at giving intravenous uh, TPA uh, in the field or at the outside hospital, uh, much like what they do with stroke. Uh, the University of Chicago, of, I'm sorry, of Colorado has been doing this for years, and I've just been waiting for Dr. Wagner to publish her results. Um, if you live in Europe, you have the option of Iloprost, and um, uh, I think some work has to be done to see if we can bring that agent to the U.S. Um, and then finally, I wanted to kind of add to the protocol, um, spec CT or a bone scan, but I would favor spec CT, should be um, obtained within five days from injury, um, and then an operative plan should be made. Uh, patients should not be kept weeks to months to have their, um, their amputations performed. Um, if they have viable tissue, they should discharge on anti-inflammatory agents and anticoagulation for a month, and they should have protective wear. So, are we out of the ice age? I think we're emerging. I'm not totally happy where we're at. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We definitely need to have a large randomized controlled trial with TPA and, and or Iloprost. Uh, we've been trying to convince the military of that. And so far they have not, um, they have not acquiesced uh, with funding. Um, those studies need to be well-planned. We need to have absolutely documented the time of rewarming. We have to have perfusion details and how they were obtained so that we can accurately calculate digit salvage. We have to have time to infusion and we have to agree on outcome assessments. Um, we also have to look at long-term outcomes. We need to follow these patients for chronic pain, for um, uh, uh, future amputations, um, for um, skin breakdown, You know all the problems that have been um, brought up in the literature. Um, and finally, we need to get the message out. Time is tissue. Um, a study out of Hennepin showed that every hour um, of delay resulted in 28% less digit salvage. So it's important that patients who get frostbitten get rewarmed timely and get to centers that can give TPA within 24 hours. So we're getting closer, we're emerging, but we're not quite there yet. So um, any questions? Dr. Urban, this is Jeannie. Um, I was hoping I, you all were still there. <laughs> I just want to thank you for giving this talk. I have to admit, I asked you to do this for partly selfish reasons because um, we do, it, it's, it's, I never expected this when I came to San Diego, but we do get frostbite. The unusual thing for us is that we frequently get these patients outside of the 24 hour window. Um, our, the first patient I can remember was somebody who was actually working in Alaska on an oil rig and sustained a frostbite injury and was actually came back to San Diego because he lived here um, about 72 hours after this happened. My second patient was a Navy person who was doing maneuvers somewhere cold and had a cold gloves on his hands and didn't realize that he was getting a frostbite injury until 24 hours later. And so came to us about 48 hours after his injury. So um, we frequently get these patients late. And so, and you know, like you said, it's hard in the burn community to find things in the literature that are consistent across the board because people do things somewhat differently depending on what you look at. And there's not a ton of stuff out there that talks about how to treat these patients. So again, this was for me personally because I wanted to see what you guys did in Iowa um, and to see if there was a, you know, what the consensus was now because it's a little hard to read the literature to figure that part out. Um, but my question to you is, so for these patients that we get, since they're delayed, what would you, 
what would you consider doing? I mean, we actually have tried TPA in these patients, mainly because they're young, otherwise healthy. There's very low risk to giving it to them. I have interventionalists that are very willing to do it. Um, and, you know, otherwise I can't really figure any other method of trying to do um, digit salvage on these patients where it actually could be career ending for some of them. Yeah, I mean, there really isn't. That's what's frustrating. That's why I think we really need Illiprost here too, because that would give us the option when you're out of window. I think also looking at starting it in the field or at the outside hospital, starting IV TPA, I don't see any problems with that. Um, and I think Dr. Wagner hasn't seen, um, has seen minimal complications with that. And it's certainly well supported in the stroke literature. Um, but it, it is still very frustrating that we have very limited options. And I would say that one thing that was frustrating, it's still frustrating to me, is when you look at the TPA literature, people start infusions or, or they use criteria that they use, their, they either use criteria from um, time from rewarming of less than 24 hours, time from cold exposure of less than 48. So it runs the whole gamut. So I would say if it's, if you have significant tissue at risk, I would extend your window. If you have if you have uh, interventionist who's willing to do it, I would extend that window. I mean, I don't think you have much, you know, much to lose, as you say. And the literature, I mean, I didn't tell you, but one review that looked at the literature thought that TPA should be, the literature was, was so incomplete or inconclusive that they thought TPA should be relegated to research. I think that's a little extreme. I think you're holding back some really, uh, limb preserving um, modality to patients that otherwise would have nothing. So um, I would say if you have it available and you're looking at a devastating frostbite injury, I would say, and you have a, you know, a perfusion deficit and you have no contraindications, then I would say you should give it. Thank you very much. Dr. Wibbenmeyer, this is Brian Clary, Chair of the Department of Surgery. I just wanna say thank you so much for virtually being here and uh, presenting this uh, incredible lecture. I must admit, um, I don't think I've ever really thought about frostbite. And I can't even remember actually in my residency having a lecture on frostbite. So this has been a completely foreign topic to me uh, and actually really fun and exciting to learn something that, again, I haven't really ever thought about. And it was just very well presented. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, you know, obviously when, when we're hearing about things that we don't really um, think about every day or that aren't really part of our practices, uh, one question is, well, do, do themes of this bleed over to other parts of our practices uh, and patients that we do see? So for example, the use of the, of the, the SPECT CT scan, you know, is that something that, that came over from vascular surgery or orthopedics and determine amputation levels for per peripheral artery disease, or if it hasn't, perhaps maybe is that something that should bleed over from the frostbite world into the peripheral artery disease? So that's one question. My second question is really about uh, kind of your comments about, you know, stroke uh, care and the way in which the stroke community has developed, you know, uh, stroke networks and accreditation uh, programs. So I was just wondering if within Iowa or in your surrounding area, have you worked to try to create that sort of network with your local hospitals uh, and or through, you know, the critical care communities to create maybe accreditation standards or expectations for care? And again, thank you so much uh, for, for bringing this to our attention. So, you know, I was interested enough, I was going to look up SPEC CT and see who uses it. Because this article, I forget exactly, it, all these articles have kind of been very recently published. That uh, article looking at spec CT um, was from the military, from a military hospital. And I actually don't know what else it's used in. So it's, to me, I, I'm not sure it would give the, the vascular surgeons the detail that like maybe a CTA would. I don't know though, I'm not a vascular surgeon. So I can't really answer that. Um, but I certainly think it, it does give the detail needed for amputations, especially when you're looking at soft tissue uh, in bone. So, um, uh, and in terms of your uh, increasing the frostbite network and centers of excellence, um, yeah. So I, so now I was, as Jeannie forced me to get this lecture together, I have huge plans to um, kind of take this uh, either virtually 
or to uh, other hospitals in Iowa. And um, just like Stroke, um, you know, start a, a campaign um, that, you know, time is tissue when we're talking about frostbite and, uh, you know, time to infusion um, is critical and uh, just kind of get the message out with a lot of PSAs. And um, a lot, as you can imagine, the Midwest burn centers are extremely interested in trying to figure out frostbite and, and a better way to treat it because we all see it. Come winter, we all see it. So, and as you can see, it, um, sometimes um, these injuries are happening. Most of the time they're happening to um, patients who are young and they're quite morbid and um, amputations are nothing anyone really in enjoys to have to have to have to do for patients so it's um has a lot of sadness with it too yeah thank you any other questions out there i'm going to take that as a note dr Wimar, thank you so much for participating virtually um, maybe at some point next year when the covid craziness has died down we can have you come for another visit I know. I'd rather be there. <laughs> Thank you again. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a really wonderful day. You too.